Thank you. You may be seated. Happy Sabbath, church. It's another wonderful and beautiful day to uh, come together as God's children and uh, hear a word from Him. Uh, before we begin this morning, I'd like to open with a word of prayer. Uh, Father God, we thank you for all that you have done for us. We thank you for this day. And we ask that you may please fill us with your Holy Spirit. As we hear a word from you, may it penetrate, penetrate deep in our hearts. It may transform us from within. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today's message is titled, In the Potter's Hands. In the Potter's Hands. Um, I want to start by uh, sharing this uh, um, image um, have you guys seen this before? Or how many of you know about um, the kintsugi uh, bow or the kintsugi art? So um, if I probably don't know it as well as uh, some of you that know this, but um, uh, the Japanese um, have this technique um, of um, creating uh, and molding a, a clay pot and, you know, after they have, you know, decorated and it's all finished, they actually grab a hammer and they just smash it uh, into pieces like those. And then what they do, they use this gold-like material to put the pieces back together. And in this way, actually, the bowl looks uh, a lot better. I don't know, to some people, I guess it might not, uh, but I think it looks, it looks a lot better. And um, also, it's more stronger uh, with the material that they use to hold the pieces that were broken uh, back together. I mean, and uh, it's, it's a transformation process that this whole thing goes um, through, uh, taking something that was once just, uh, um, just uh, clay and transforming it into such a beautiful uh, bowl that we, uh, most of us have in our homes. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's something, it's a concept that the Bible is always also talking about. The concept of transformation is spoken of very often in the Bible. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, God's desire for each one of us us, according to Romans 12, verse 2, is that we may be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The Bible tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. To be transformed is to experience a thorough and dramatic change in form and appearance. A perfect example of this is a caterpillar uh, being transformed into a beautiful butterfly. Uh, many of us uh, see butterflies, and uh, as kids, uh, kids uh, see butterflies and like, oh, I wish I could be a beautiful, as beautiful as a butterfly, but they don't understand what the butterfly has to go through in order to become the beautiful uh, uh, butterfly that we see and love and enjoy watching. It goes through a transformation process, a complete breakdown of what it used to be and being remade into something new. Some of us may think about that process and maybe think, man, that's, that must be painful to be completely broken down and being remade into something else. And maybe some of us feel like it's probably uncomfortable too. But the reality is that we go through transformation process all the time. At least that's what God desires to do for us and with us. 
I used to, uh, we, when we went to school, uh, when I was back home in Africa, uh, we used to pass by uh, a potter's house. Uh, there was this uh, house. Uh, so background story to this is, um, so uh, I've talked about the two uh, ethnic groups um, that, that, um, that are back, uh, that, you know, existed, that lived in the place that I, I grew up in, the Hutus and the, the Tutsis. But there was a third ethnic group that it's not talked about mostly, and that is the Twa, T-W-A, Twa. And uh, their profession was to make pots out of clay. That's what the, most of, of them, that's what they did. And so, so this uh, potter's house that we always passed by, it was, it was occupied by uh, Twa's. Uh, and they were constantly just making pots. And uh, so there was this, um, this uh, I want to say, um, something that the kids made up. Uh, as we went through, uh, as we went past this house, they said that um, if you were to whistle while they're making pots inside, the pots would break. And I mean, that's very intriguing and, and, and uh, exciting for a kid to hear because as soon as you mention that, guess what we want to do? You want to whistle, right? Because I mean, how cool would it, would it be to just whistle and see all the pots inside break, right? And uh, I mean, we were, we were, I was a kid and uh, uh, of course we would dare each other because if, uh, if, if the pots that these people are working so hard to create uh, break because of some uh, stupid kid outside whistled, guess what they were going to do? They were going to come after us. And so we, we didn't just whistle ju just, for the fun, uh, just, uh, just to do it. We actually dared each other because we were scared and terrified. And so um, I remember this one day, uh, I think uh, some of the kids that I was with um, just dared, I think, one of us to whistle. And uh, the, the goal was to whistle and just take off running. I don't actually remember what ended up happen, happening, uh, but um, it was just interesting to just, just, I don't know, realize that, I mean, if it was true, I mean, just imagine how devastating it would have been for, you know, these uh, potters inside uh, to just have worked so hard, only to just, uh, for a kid to just destroy all the work that they hadn't done. In the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 18, uh, for those that are reading the Bible with me, uh, actually, we just finished reading Jeremiah 18 yesterday, and uh, so you, might have, um, you may have some insights on what we're going to talk about today, um, but Jeremiah is invited to go to a potter's house by God. God uh, asks him, hey, I would like for you to go down to the potter's house. There's a message I have for you. And this morning, I would like to invite you to come along with me as we go down with Jeremiah to the potter's house and hear the message that God has for us. Jeremiah chapter 18. And a little bit of the background to, uh, to this story uh, is that, um, of course, the Israelites are God's chosen people, and he has brought them into the, the, the promised land. But what has happened is that um, uh, they have taken up uh, the worshiping of the idols, the false gods of the nations around them. And they have neglected the God who delivered them, the God who brought them into this place. And of course, God being merciful, being loving, being so gracious and compassionate, he sends prophets he sends prophets, one after another, to warn them of the path that they're heading down in. He warns them, if you keep going down this path, you're going to be just like the other nations. And he reminds them that the only one who can deliver you from the attacks that are being planned all around you is me but you are choosing to reject me. You are choosing to push me away because you want these man-made gods who cannot hear, who cannot speak, who cannot walk to be 
your guardian to be the, one, the, the ones to protect you from the calamities that are coming. And so God sends uh, prophets like Ezra. Nehemiah comes and goes. Uh, uh, Nathan comes and goes. Isaiah comes and, and goes. And all these prophets come and what the, pe- the, the people uh, ends up just per- persecuting them and not heeding to the message that they are bringing to them about an impending calamity. And so it's time for Jeremiah. And God's been speaking to Jeremiah to deliver the, same, the very same message all these prophets have been delivering. And he gets to a point where in Jeremiah 18, God asks him to take a trip down to the potter's house. And the message that God sends through Jeremiah is for God's people to repent, God's people to return back to him, because God can't be where he is not invited. In fact, in uh, Revelation uh, 3.20, God tells us, um, sorry, in uh, Revelation 3.20, behold, stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. God is a gentleman, stands at the door and just waits for us to invite him in our house, our lives. And that is what's happening in in Israel. God can protect them, but they don't want his protection. God is not choosing to turn his back on them, but they have chosen to reject him and to send him away, far away from them, because they don't need anything from him. They can take care of themselves. But imagine, imagine what would happen if we invited God back into our society. Imagine what would happen if we invited God back into our school systems, our governments. Imagine what would happen if God was actually welcomed in our workplaces. Imagine what would happen, how it would look like if God was actually in our homes. And it's sad to even say this last one, but imagine what church would be like if God was actually the center of worship. I've seen, I've, I've seen videos um, online and on Instagram of pastors, uh, uh, they call them celebrity pastors, whose goal is to bring all the attention to self. And it saddens me to see the, the millions and the thousands of people in the pews just listening to this person not given a message that, that points them to Christ, but a message that, is, uh, that, that brings the glory to them, to themselves. And I just, I, just, I just can't help it but imagine what it would look like if we actually invited God back into our churches all over the world. God wants to be in all of these areas and take control But we must allow him in before he can do all these things that he desires to do. And in the the time of Jeremiah, Babylon is actually on the verge of attacking. They're planning to invade Israel and Jerusalem. And Jeremiah's message is for God's people to repent and come back to him so that he can deliver them. And so he sends, he sends uh, him to the potter's house, and we find this story in uh, Jeremiah 18, uh, verses 1 through 6. Uh, it says, uh, the potter and the clay, it's the, uh, the title of the passage, heard that I came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, working at the wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was was spoiled in, in the potter's hands, and he reworked it into another vessel, 
as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hands, O house of Israel. As we are here down at the potter's house, I, I want us to, 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 to recognize uh, a few things. There are three lessons that I want us to take away from, uh, from our time here at the potter's house. You may n- notice other lessons. Of course, every per- God speaks to every individual in here uh, differently and in a unique way. But uh, together, uh, there are three lessons that I want us to, to walk away from this house. And the first one is, the potter chooses and separates clay from any impurities. If you have ever uh, worked with uh, uh, clay, uh, if you've been, if you've made pots or anything from clay, uh, you notice, you you, you recognize that you have to, to select the kind of clay that you want to use. If it, if, it has, if, it, if it hasn't already been selected for you, uh, like uh, for us when I was back home, we, we actually uh, did some, uh, some uh, pottering, and uh, we would actually go to a place where the clay was, but it wasn't pure clay. It was mixed with dirt and other things, and so when you, when you got the, the clay, you had to divide all the impurities, all the things that um, would uh, uh, not... Uh, uh, help uh, you create and design the perfect pot, you would have to remove all those things from the clay and then begin the work of designing your perfect pot or whatever you wanted to make out of it. John fifteen sixteen tells us, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Yes, God chose you with all your impurities. Amen? If God had to wait for us to be perfect, we would have never been chosen. And just like a potter chooses clay that still has impurities in it, God chooses us while we are still imperfect. God chooses us while we're still struggling with various things. But you you, you can say, but pastor, I, I still struggle with lying. That's okay, God chose you. But I still struggle with lust. God chose you. But I still struggle with gambling. God chose you. You see, Jesus chooses you and calls you as you are, but something else happens when you come to him. The potter must remove the impurities from the clay, and God does the same for us when we come to him. God must remove certain things from your life in order to effectively use you. There are certain crowds God will remove you from before you are transformed into the perfect image. Of God, There are certain words God will remove from your mouth when he calls you. There are certain doors you won't be able to walk through anymore when God calls you because he has a purpose for you. You can't stay the same. You cannot stay the same as the place you've been when God calls you. The clay was once a part of the dirt. And it was probably comfortable, but uh, for it to be transformed into a beautiful pot, into a beautiful vessel like this, the impurities must be removed. And so uh, the clay must be removed from the dirt it's mixed with. And that's why sometimes you can't fit in with certain people. That's why sometimes you can't fit in certain places. 
I've experienced this myself uh, at school. Um, you know, I joined this group of people, and, and immediately, when God has chosen you, when God has removed some impurities out of you, you will come to this group of people. You will, uh, the, and the moment you arrive, they notice that there is something off with you. They call you weird because you can't do the things that they're doing. And you try your best to do those things, but you can't because God has chosen you. God has called you and he has removed those things out of you. You don't belong in the dirt you once were a part of anymore. Amen? And so the people will recognize that you don't fit and they call you names and uh, all that is because God has called you to a higher purpose. God has called you and have changed some, th- some things about you, and there's a distinction. There has to be a distinction between you and where you used to be. The second lesson that we are to learn from this, uh, this uh, experience and this visit to the potter's house is that transformation takes place on the wheel. Transformation takes place on the will. You know, we, we all love to hear that, oh, God has a, has a plan for you. And you're like, we're like, yeah, God has a plan for us. That's awesome. We all love to hear that God has a, has a beautiful destiny for us. And we're like, yes, a beautiful destiny for us. That's awesome. And we love to hear and read and sing about uh, there's a home in glory land that outshines the sun. And we're like, yes. That's where I want to be. But we forget that in order for any of this to happen, we got to get on that wheel first. We have to allow God to place us on that wheel. You know, the Israelites... um, thought that they could have all the the, the promises that God had promised them without God. The Israelites thought that they they could get to the promised land without God. They thought that they could live uh, in the land uh, and enjoy the milk and honey that God had promised without God. But God constantly reminds them that these things aren't independent of me. These things Uh, are because of me. They come with me. It's a complete package. In order for you to experience the purpose that I have for you, in order for you to to, to, to live in the destiny that I have for you, in order for you to, to experience the peace and all these other things, you have to have me. It is not something that you can do outside of me. It comes with me. It is who God is. And so they thought that um, they could experience the peace, the security, and the abundance outside of God, but God reminds them that it's a package deal. You have got to be willing to get on the wheel and, and, and allow God to transform them so that they're fit to live in the destiny and to experience the, in the, and, 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 and to walk in the purpose and experience all the good that God has for them. And another thing to recognize as we're still here is that the will is spinning. The will is spinning. And the clay is on that wheel, and the potter is working on the clay, transforming it into the beautiful vessel, the beautiful pot that he desired for it to be. Sometimes we experience things spinning in our lives. Sometimes we feel like our marriages are spinning. 
Sometimes we feel like our relationships with our children are spinning. Sometimes we feel like uh, uh, just uh, just our, our work, uh, t- you know, our workplace with, uh, with uh, the, and the relationships we have with our uh, uh, co-workers uh, is spinning out of control. But uh, I just want to remind you that while you are on that wheel, and while the wheel is spinning, while it seems like your life is spinning out of control, the Potter is working on you. Amen. The Potter never stops working. His hands are moving and shaping uh, the, 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 the clay into, into a, a design that is beautiful. But while he's doing that, the will spins. So just remember, when it seems like our lives are spinning out of control, God is working. When it seems like we're just spinning in circle and not getting anywhere, God is working. When it seems like we're hitting a brick wall, God is working. So remember, you got to get on that wheel for God to work on you. And while God is working, and it may seem like nothing is happening, but God is still working. And always remember that. Always remember that. God is always working. The last lesson I want us to, uh, to, look, to uh, look together is that you must choose to remain in the potter's hand. You must re- uh, choose to remain in the potter's hands. Uh, there's something interesting that, uh, that happens uh, as Jeremiah is watching the potter. It says that the pot that he's working on gets marred or uh, gets um, deformed uh, and, and he has to, 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 to crash it down and remake it into something new. That's interesting to notice that even when we are in God's hands, when God is working on us, sometimes we or the pot is going to get deformed a little, and God has to crush it. Why does that happen, actually? Why does that happen? You see, when a potter is working on the clay, uh, sometimes they, uh, they feel as if they have removed all the impurities, but as the wheel is spinning and their, you know, their hands is you know, working around this, this vessel, uh, sometimes there, there are some impurities, maybe uh, a rock that was not removed out of this vessel. And, and, and it, creates, um, it, it creates complication. The potter cannot create what he intends to create if this rock is still in the pot, in the, in the clay. And so one or two things happens. The potter removes the rock, but when he removes it, he has to start all over again. He has to crash that thing down and recreate something different, something new out of this, uh, the, this clay. As we are spinning on the wheel, on the wheel, and, and God is working uh, to transform us, sometimes He finds impurities in us too. We, we, we must remember that God uh, is in the process of sanctifying us. We are in the process of being, re, uh, being uh, reformed and transformed into the image of God. And, and, and uh, we're, we're not completely like this clay. I, uh, this is a, this is a, a, pers- a personification of God's children. We make decisions. We make choices. And even while we're in God's hands, sometimes we slip. We might slip into our old habits. And at that time, uh, according to this story, the potter must remove this impurity and start over again. And God finds 
impurities all the time when he's working on us. He finds impurities in us too, places that need to be cleansed, habits that need to be broken, pet sins that we need to break free from, environments we need to be removed from. And every time this happens, we have a choice. We can either let God remove these things from our lives, which will involve being crushed and remade. Or we can say, you know what? I can do it myself, God. I, I, I can figure out a, a different way that does not involve uh, me having to suffer. I can find a different way that does not involve me having to give up so much. I can find a different way that does not involve me having to sacrifice so much. When we are in the potter's hands, God calls us to sacrifice some things. Like we saw before, the clay used to be a part of the dirt. And sometimes... Uh, that old desire to be where we used to be might come back and we might actually uh, find ourselves there again. But God tells us that when that happens, he needs to keep working on us. He needs to remove those things. He needs to continue transforming us into the perfect image of God. The thing is that if God doesn't do it, it can't be done. The clay can't make itself into this beautiful vessel. The clay cannot put it, uh, go on the wheel and form itself into this vessel. God has to do it. The potter has to do it. John 15, 5 tells us that I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, is, he it is that bears much fruit, and for apart from me you can do nothing. John 15, 5. You can try all you want to walk through those doors in your life that you see before you. But if God isn't the one that asks you to walk through those doors, the only thing that you'll find behind those doors are disappointments, heartaches, and confusion. You can try to fix your marriage on your own, but you'll only feel like you're putting bandage on a wound, on a wound that is not healing. You can try to raise kids your way, but it'll backfire eventually in your face when you find out that they weren't grounded in the morals and values that comes from God. You can try to lead your ministry the way you see fit, but will eventually leave you exhausted, disappointed, and will cause you to want to give up because you're not seeing the results that you expected. But when you realize that it is the Holy Spirit that works on every person's heart to transform them into the image of God, then you will come to this place where you feel disappointed because you feel like you are the one that needed to do it. But if God doesn't do it, he cannot get done. I want to read uh, Jeremiah, the same chapter, 18. Um, I want to read uh, verses uh, 11, I believe. Now, therefore, say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am shaping disaster against you and devising a plan against you. Return everyone from his evil way and amend your ways and your deeds. 12. But they say, That is in vain. We will follow our own plans and will 
Will everyone act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart? We will follow our plans and will everyone follow after the desires of their evil heart? Many times God calls us. He calls us so that he can transform us. He calls us so that he can change us. But many times our response, our responses are like that of the men of Israel, Israelite. They say, we don't need you. <clears throat> we can do it on our own. They say, we want to experience all the good that comes from this land, but we don't need you. And as Christians, sometimes we uh, we feel like we can, we, we, we can call ourselves Christians without going through the transformation process. And that is exactly the problem in here. The Israelites want to be the chosen people. The Israelites want to experience all the good from God, but they don't need God. And that's a problem that we face today. And Jesus, God, tells Jeremiah, like this potter, can I not also take you as clay in my hands and transform you into the perfect image of God? You know, we are like broken pots Sometimes we feel like there's, we're not enough to go to God. We feel like we need to put the pieces back together uh, before um, we can be accepted by God. But God, like the potter, even when the pot is broken, takes it back, smushes it back together, and reform, recreates something that is far more beautiful than before. Amen? I'm so glad that we have a potter that does not discard broken pieces, amen? I'm so glad that we have a potter that takes marred pots and recreates them into something far more beautiful. I love Jeremiah because uh, um, he was actually, Jesus was actually thought to be like Jeremiah because of just the way he, he was, the way he dealt with people. Jeremiah loved object lessons, and God actually loved using him with object lessons. There's actually a time where God asks him to, uh, to create a yoke and tie it around his neck and walk around to the gates of the city to actually, uh, so that people can see, and, 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 and after they do that, he would then tell them, this is exactly what's going to happen to you in a few years. And so as God sends him to the potter's house, it is, it, it, it is something that's visual, that, 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 that he can see and can relate, to, can tell the elders of Israel, the people of Israel, of what God intends to do with them. God tells them that they're like broken pieces, kind of like this pot right here that was once whole when God created it from the beginning. And somewhere along the way, you know, because of deceptions, because of just uh, uh, running after selfish desires and, and, and going after other things that actually don't fulfill, we got broken just like this. But God sees us 
in our broken state. And he sees all these broken pieces. And for us, we look at ourselves and we're like, we're worthless. Just toss us away. Just throw us in the garbage. But God sees these broken pieces and he, he doesn't see a broken pot. He sees an opportunity. God sees an opportunity to create something more beautiful out of the broken pieces. And today, the invitation is that whatever pieces you have in your lives, whether they're big or small, God wants those pieces. God wants these pieces so that he can recreate you. God wants to, 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 to transform you, to remake you into the perfect image of God. There is not any safer, secure, loving hands that you could be in than the hands of God. Those are the hands that are capable of recreating you just as they created you in the beginning. Give him your broken pieces today, friends. Because God will not turn you away. God will not call you a worthless cause. He'll say you're worth it. And I will do everything in my powers to make sure you're a whole. And so today God desires to give you the peace that you need in your life. God desires to give you the rest for your souls. And all he needs from you is your broken pieces. And so my challenge for you today is that you don't look at yourself as some worthless cause. That you don't see yourself as one who does not have value. But look at yourself as one who is loved by the God Most High. The one who God was willing to give up everything for because you are worth it. So no matter the pieces in your life, take them to God. Take them to the potter. And I promise you that he will reshape you. He will remake you. And he will transform you into the perfect image of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are loving, that you are kind, that you are gracious. We thank you that you look past our brokenness and see a completed work. And this morning we come to you, broken as we are, in the hands of the potter. Please remake us, reshape us, Form us and transform us into the perfect design that you intend for each one of us to become. To be used by you in ways that will glorify and honor your name. Bless each and every person here today and those listening and watching online. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.